Good morning. It's Dr. John Bennett from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. We have the honor of having Mustafa Buskaya for the second week in a row. He's got a full schedule, so we'll get going. And we'll have Yuha give a proper neurosurgery introduction. Good morning, Yuha. Good morning. Good evening from here. Now, it's okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Professor Mustafa, Mustafa Baskaya, welcome. He's from Madison, Wisconsin, USA. He's one of the most active neurosurgeons of these times in the world. He graduated at medical school in Ankara, Turkey, 1987, and made double neurosurgical training in Turkey, and then later also in USA, and also five fellowships. The first one was by Sukita in Nagoya, Japan, and then several prominent places in USA for years. So actually his training, like he told the last time, it took 17 years, but it, it certainly made him, him extremely good and very profound training. So his present, his present position is at Madison, Wisconsin. I always saw this slide, how to become a good neurosurgeon. I never met a person who wanted to be a bad neurosurgeon. So train hard and learn anatomy. Follow the way Professor Mustafa Baskaya has done and is doing all the time actively. There are different levels of manual skills. It depends on number of repetitions, either in laboratory or in operation room. It depends on the length of career. There is a common rule of 10,000 hours of training. With these 10,000 hours of training, you will be, become world-class. And my own rule is that after 10,000 days in operation room, you had your best as a neurosurgeon. Neurosurgery has three parts, operative skills and then research, clinical and basic. Usually we neurosurgeons are doing clinical research and then teaching. High number of residents are fellows are following Professor Mustafa, Mustafa Baskaya has more than 300 publications, has been actively attending in congresses and nowadays uh, we are doing webinars. He's giving also live courses and have been involved in them. He's very active in neurosurgical social media. Every week we can see beautiful operations uh, there. And he has, what is very special, has extremely good and active cardiology laboratory. You should learn anatomy until end of your life. My teacher in anatomy in Zurich, Professor Chayan Tundery, was always shouting loudly, medical study is a lifelong study and anatomy even more. So our lifetime is too short to learn exactly the anatomy. So this picture, preparation from cadaver is from Mustafa Baskaya's cadaveric laboratory from his collaborator, Emil Avsi from Turkey. Professor Mustafa Baskaya is fighting heavily on the side of microneurosurgery. He belongs to Yasak School, like many of us. Actually, all the neurosurgeons in the world belong to Yasak School in some generation. So train your best young people. They should become better than you. Professor, late Professor Drake, my teacher, was always saying that he wants to have young people who are getting better than him. If he does, doesn't meet them, then he will wait. And someday they will come. 
So I welcome Professor Mustafa Baskaya. He will speak today on acoustic neurinomas surgery, and it will be certainly interesting lecture and discussion after that. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Yuha. Thank you for a wonderful introduction. And uh, you know that you are one of my heroes and one of my mentors. Actually, I call you and my mentors uh, the Japanese word, uh, but shokinins, uh, they are gui guides. They, they guide you in a right path and mentor you. You don't have to train with certain people. You can, you can have mentors uh, in different continents, different countries. And you made me open my eyes in Helsinki Life Course. And, and again, I thank John Bennett, Dr. Bennett, uh, uh, Dr. Binzu, Dr. Kohn for translating, and all the panelists and organizers. Thank you very much for having me. So I'll start sharing with my screen. So today I'm going to talk about the, uh, the vestibular schwannoma, microsurgery for vestibular schwannomas, and how I become I have become uh, familiar with uh, translabyrinthine approach. And as you know, neurosurgeons are not very familiar with the translabyrinthine approach. We like retrosigmoid, and retrosigmoid, retromastoid approaches are the workhorse of the neurosurgery, like terminal approach, no question. But uh, once I I become more familiar and I start liking the translab. So I, I thought maybe I'll talk about the translab a little bit and introduce you to translab approach, how, uh, how versatile approach it is, and, and then hopefully convince you you can do it. Uh, so I have no disclosures, and this is our lovely city medicine. We welcome everybody. And to have the to perform these, the team approach is very important. So UW, University of Wisconsin skull based team, myself, my, my neurosurgeon colleagues, and but especially these two people, uh, Dr. Mark Pyle, Professor Mark Pyle and Professor Joseph Roche, uh, they are extremely important and key, they have a key role performing these approaches. So we do all acoustic neuromas, whichever approach we do, retrosigmoid, I do the craniotomy, they do the drilling of the internal acoustic canal. Can I drill? Yes, but this is, this is what the deal with gentlemanship deal we have. And can I do translab? Yes, but it's gonna take longer. They are more facile and much faster and better than me. And in the translab, they do the approach, I remove the tumor. And then in the re uh, middle fossa, the same way. So we always, do these surgeries together as a team, and that increases the success rate, the sharing the responsibility, sharing the parts of the surgery, and everybody does the, what they are good at, okay? So uh, uh, what are the treatment options for, uh, 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 how do we get rid of this bar? Uh, um, so, Observation is one thing. Microsurgery is always is the most important role in treatment of these uh, 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 pathologies. Translab approach, middle fossa approach, retrosigmoid approach, and uh, radiation treatment. Can you guys see me? Something happened. Okay. So and retrosigmoid approach. So there are three main surgical approaches and the radiation treatment, yes, of course, as a role, uh, what, what do we do for that? Gamma knife, LINAC, tomotherapy, cyber knife. And there's a, this is a new concept, concept, hybrid treatment. So you do subtotal resection and then the radiation, which uh, I don't agree as a goal, but sometimes if you have to, you have to. Uh, so, uh, I, it's something, it's not advancing. Okay. 
it's my slides are not advancing okay uh maybe click it again you may have to start from the slide before you'll get it stop tv okay just okay just start again that's okay okay you can see it well okay so aim of vestibular surgery is a you know maximum safe resection with aim of gross total resection that's the that's the our goal should be and while you are doing this do is you have to preserve the facial nerve function and if hearing is serviceable you have to preserve the hearing and and you shouldn't have a high morbidity mortality is not a even question uh, mortality should be zero or at least near zero in in large series uh, so this is the way in 1915 uh, in the campus book that's how they describe they did the acoustic neuromas golden finger technique, right? If you do it this way nowadays, you won't have any of these goals established. So selection of the approach, all depends on the level of hearing and the size of the tumor, location of the tumor. Intracanalicular tumors with good hearing, middle fossa is a, is a very good approach. Uh, uh, and, and if tumor is located all the way lateral into the internal acoustic canal, if there is some systemal portion, uh, middle fossa can be a problem addressing that portion. So retrosigmoid is better for that. If no hearing at all, you complete, you complete loss of hearing function, then you can do retrosigmoid or translabent. So this is the this is the approach showing the uh, 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 this is the showing the, how you uh, uh, differentiate two approaches, right? This is a, almost similar ages, similar type of tumors. So one is on the right side here, 44-year-old woman. And if you look at carefully, there's a fundal cap. There's a CSF in the lateral aspect of the internal acoustic canal. Here, tumor is slightly bigger. Same little on the left side intracanalicular, but there's no fundal cap. Although there's a systemic, a little bit systemic portion of this tumor, you can do this uh, uh, with the middle fossa. Middle fossa is going to be the perfect approach for this. And that's, that's what we did. And in, in both cases, we established the tumor, complete tumor resection, as well as the preservation of the facial function and, and hearing, serviceable hearing. So in large tumors, Again, hearing is the important factor, you, how you choose the uh, 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 treatment. <clears throat> Good hearing will attempt to remove uh, 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 a tumor via retrosigmoid approach. Poor hearing, no serviceable, or baseline like 50-50 is very large tumor that uh, hearing preservation is not reasonable possibility then you do translabyrinthine approach. <coughs> so what are the main factors? Level of hearing, depth of the tumor extension into internal acoustic canal, having that CSF signal and the lateral canal, we call it fundal cap. Position of sigmoid sinus as anterior, posterior. These are important. Very anterior sigmoid uh, sinus location is perfect for retrosigmoid. You have a large space, is not good for translab, but and the other contrary, if the you have a very posterior sigmoid sinus junction, is going to be difficult to get that tumor via in, uh, retro sigmoid. So anterior approach, tra uh, translab will be better. Presence of high jugular bulb, if mastoid is very small, contracted, is not good for uh, 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 a translab approach. And if you have no flow on the contralateral transfer sinus, sigmoid sinus, you don't want to take a risk of drilling bone over the sigmoid sinus, so you better not to do 
translab. And most importantly, experience of that surgeon. And tumor size has little effect on choosing the approach between retrosigmoid and translab. So now I'm going to introduce you to translab approach. What are the advantages? It you early identify the facial nerve, the compressed facial nerve, and if necessary, even you can decompress the segment of the facial nerve in the labyrinthine uh, uh, area, labyrinthine segment. Direct route to the cerebellar pontine angle. It's that you directly follow on to the cerebellar pontine angle, and almost purely epidural approach. So you don't even sometimes in some small tumors, you don't even see the cerebellum at all. You work on the presigmoid dura. So you retract the dura with your instruments, bipolars or the suctions, and that makes a big difference in postoperative course. Most of the patients don't have a postoperative headache or pain uh, uh, on the, on, in contrast, retrosigmoid patients will will always complain <laughs> pain, and there's a five to 10% chance of post craniotomy headaches in the, in the uh, retrosigmoid uh, approaches. And you expose internal acoustic canal, if you drill really well, 270 degree. That's very important. And also questionable, this is questionable, maybe it is associated with less uh, CSF leak than the retrosigmoid, and wider, way wider anterior and superior exposure. So disadvantages, difficulty in exposing some tumors extending too anteriorly, limited exposure of the caudal extension in the lower clivus, and wide inferior brainstem attachment and high jugular bulb sometimes limit this approach. And contraindications having the active chronic otitis media and mastoiditis. Uh, so you should not perform this surgery. You can spread the infection. And this is the uh, cadaveric dissection performed by uh, uh, Dr. Mark Pyle for our uh, uh, book. We are co-editing, edit this book. So you can watch these in 3D. So... First, identify the anatomical landmarks. Like you have said, anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. If you go to the lab, you can do the temporal bone dissection in the dry skulls first, then go to the cadaveric heads and identify these important anatomical landmarks. And that, they will lead you to do your, your target. And slowly, slowly, and once you identify the semicircular canals, you drill them. You complete the uh, vestibulectomy and then expose the co cochlear duct. You can get a CSF from the cochlear duct, de decompress uh, the brain, and identification of the genital ganglion, facial nerve, Bill's bar, and the internal acoustic canal. So incision for small tumors, this is a enough incision. And you elevate and you always get uh, temporalis fascia for reconstruction and position. We like to do these uh, surgeries in spine position with head slightly turned, like 70 degree or so. It's very comfortable. You can do your surgery standing or sitting. Uh, it, 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 so you don't have to. And also drilling this bone three hours in, if you are doing in sitting position, won't be possible. Surgeon's shoulder will be uh, will be uh, uh, frozen. So we prefer spine position, which is very physiologic in my, in my opinion. So you first drill the mastoidectomy, drill the mastoid, perform the mastoid, then do the labyrinthectomy, and then the expose this, you achieve this 270 degree internal acoustic canal uh, exposure. And that is the key. And it's, see, it is very wide from labyrinthine segment all the way to the porous acousticus and the systemal segment of the facial nerve. So this is a case example, four centimeter, left-sided hearing loss, young female, as is, is, so size, not important. We can get this with retrosigmoid or translab. Our, our choice was translab, and that's what we did it. As you see here, uh, drilling the mastoid, 
uh, and uh, so getting the getting the internal acoustic canal you see opening the canal in the high magnification this dura can be a uh, very very thin or sometimes is completely disappeared this is superior superior vestibular nerve identifying the superior vestibular nerve after stimulating the facial nerve and then amputating the uh, <clears throat> superior vestibular nerve in the distal canal and that's going to bring to do other nerves into the view at that stage we stop we go to the presigmoid dura here uh, and as you see this is i am gently retracting the sigmoid sinus there is a tiny layer of the bone left on the sigmoid sinus then is the rest is intracranial microsurgery. Uh, it is the same principles we apply uh, 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 removing the extraaxial tumors in any, any location. And debulking is the key in these cases. Do not try to dissect too early after initial identification of the structures. You go debulk, debulk, dissect, circumferential dissection as much as you can and then go for the facial nerve or if you are doing retrosigmoid for hearing preservation, go for the uh, uh, cochlear nerve. So, for, so be in the lower pole, we identify the lower cranial nerves now and see gentle retraction on the tumor. And that's gonna be the, this is the lower cranial nerve. This is going to be the choroid plexus. So more anterior you go, you'll get to the, entry zone of the eighth nerve. And then you work between lower pole, upper pole of the tumor, and then the medial side of the tumor. And again, debulk, debulk, debulk. And then you can exchange your plans. You can go back to the canal and you can go come back to the uh, systemal part, cerebellar pontine angle. And th this is it's hard to follow some of these videos. So it's now I'm identifying the trigeminal nerve there. It's, it's severely compressed. Then I'm going back and removing more, more tumor. Idea is to eventually get to the brain stem and there's always these engorged, extremely congested veins at the, uh, and they come from the tumor towards the brain stem, okay? So you need to be very careful with them. So now I identify the cranial nerve eight coming out from the brainstem. It looks healthy, but this patient didn't have a serviceable hearing. Sometimes this nerve is not easily identifiable, is kind of blended, blends into the tumor. So you need to be, you need to know your anatomical landmarks. So, and then you use facial nerve stimulation that will help you to identify and confirm the location of the eight nerve. So now, I am confirming this is not a facial nerve. I know anatomically, but it's always confirming electrophysiologically is important. I go more ventral anterior. Here is the entry zone of the facial nerve. Okay, so we start dorsally. Now I am uh, cutting the eighth nerve. Now it's it's golden. So I have the location of the facial nerve in the canal. I have a location of the facial nerve in the brainstem entry zone. And now I need to connect these two planes. So now I'm going back to the canal. Canal part of the tumor is always more vascular. And because they get the blood supply from the uh, extradural blood supply from the dura of the internal acoustic canal. So now trigeminal nerve. And, and see, this part is, like I told you, is extremely vascular. And it sometimes is beyond the v surgical view. So you just gently, gently compress, tamponate. And see, it is bleeding from the canal dura. And you need to identify that and coagulate. Okay? And that will devascularize the tumor. I will continue these large tumors in young, young patients can be extremely vascular sometimes. But if you follow the principles of microsurgery, the vascularize, the bulk circumferential dissection without, without applying too much traction on the ner cranial nerves, you're gonna do it. See, now it's, it's 
This part, because this is not a sitting position, the blood pulls in the field, but you get used to that. And see, I'm, I'm stimulating the facial nerve. Okay, we are good and we are done. So uh, you eventually become familiar with this approach. Is in, in the beginning, it's, very, it's kind of you, you are not very, very, very well oriented. But you get better and better, and you you will love it. So this is the post op, and she did very well. Immediate post op, grade two, facial weakness uh, improve immediately, and has been tumor free. And this is what you need to do. You go there with the goal of removing hundred percent. If you cannot stop it, you can leave a tiny piece. But don't go to go to the surgery with the idea that I'm going to debulk a little bit subtotal resection and I'm going to call this maximal safe resection. You, you, we like to give fancy names. And then I'm going to radiate the rest. So then you turn an acute problem into a chronic problem for this patient, years of that tumor following. And I don't, you don't know what's, what's going to happen after 10, 15 years uh, uh, post gamma knife. We don't have data. We don't know. So this is another case, 59-year-old uh, patient presented with the walking difficulty, hearing loss, and, and lower cranial nerve dysfunction, actually. And hydrocephaly, you see, is a, is a large uh, ventricles and very cystic tumor. If the tumor is, part of the tumor is more than 30% of its cystic, these can be challenging sometimes. Uh, but again, you cystic or solid, you do the same surgery. You need to be a little bit more careful with the cystic tumors. So again, the same approach, translab, immediate post-op. Uh, we, we will be able to reach so high even with the translab. And perfect facial function. And uh, unfortunately, he needed the shunt surgery because his ventriculomegaly didn't regress. Uh, so he, his hydrocephaly had to be treated with the shunt, but that's okay. And... Another one, 58-year-old, partially cystic, very large tumor, good facial outcome, grade two immediately, grade one in long term, and again, cystic tumor. This is the fat we put and after the surgery. It looks too much, but you have to really pack these cases well. It causes a very nice sealing, and you don't have CSF leaks. Eventually, this fat gets atrophic, and you, I can show you some patients with the long term. So another one, large tumor. You can come retrosigmoid, but is is perfect case for the translab. Again, fat packing and good long term outcome. And also there are cases like patients already had a retrosigmoid approach. Okay. This is one example. 40 year old woman hearing loss, partial resection at outside hospital. Okay, look at this. And they did the retrosigmoid approach. Okay, they removed this much. But tumor continues to grow. And now patient has, patient has trigeminal neuralgia. So they recommend gamma knife. I mean, Number one, why didn't you remove this tumor very first time? She had a good hearing. She lost the hearing after surgery. And these, these are very reputable centers. These are the centers that they call themselves Mecca of uh, acoustic neuromas. So, and now look at the trigeminal nerve comparing to other side. It's severely compressed. A patient is on the high dose of medication. So is the... And patient already had retrosigmoid. This is a perfect case for recurrent tumor, residual recurrent tumor. And you come, come fresh using the same retrosigmoid approach. You drill the mastoid, you come pre-sigmoid now. So it's, 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 it fits to this and this is what we did. And we don't wanna go through the scar of the, their previous retrosigmoid approach. And we perform the translab. You see the mastoid segment internal acoustic canal, and we're gonna open the dura of the internal acoustic canal, and then opening the presigmoid dura. It 
play is a little slow. I don't know why, but uh -huh. so then facial nerve stimulation and and debulking. And when you debulk these tumors, uh, you use this uh, low intensity if tumor is soft and not if it's a sonopet, I wouldn't use more than 15, 20. Uh, and then I go, as, as I come close to the nerves, you, you go even uh, low, lowest intensity like five to 10. So I identified in the canal now superior, uh, uh, superior vestibular nerve. I cut that and I continue debulking. And now I got to the facial nerve here, you see, and these are sharp, flat knives. It's very helpful, uh, it, it, especially the big ones. And you can really apply a little bit traction and contra-traction, so that, that will help. See, this is the facial nerve at the brainstem using the very sharp arachnoid knife. It's streaming is extremely slow now. Uh, so now this that's entire thing is the facial nerve. And these suctions, I control the suctions. I don't have any other people to control. So I can adjust the suc suction and I'm using suction. It's a retraction, contra-traction. And you see, this is the nerve in the canal coming down. This is the most dangerous part of the surgery. Here you can, you can evolve the nerve, you can damage the nerve. And again, uh, uh, don't hesitate to debulk, okay? Keep debulking, keep debulking. Here is the difficulty, actually. You see the facial nerve coming here. It's not the facial nerve. It's gonna be the, uh, my uh, battery is It's not the facial nerve, it's the, it's the trigeminal nerve is more stress in this case. And patient is symptomatic from the trigeminal nerve. See that? Once I clean from the facial nerve, now I need to dissect off to trigeminal nerve. That's there. And I had more difficulty dissecting the tumor off to, off to uh, trigeminal nerve. But once you get that, you see the two components of the, facial, uh, the trigeminal nerve. It's, uh, then you connect two dissection planes. And now it's free. Okay. So using the two traction, contra-traction technique, gently and, and sharp and semi-sharp technique with the flat knife. And we are stimulating the facial nerve in the canal, in the cisternal segment. So if it stimulates perfect, then you have to uh, pack the eustachian tube put the temporalis fascia over this, and then put the fat on top of it. This is the abdominal fat. And in the past, we were not putting the lumbar drains, and the last five years or so, we start putting lumbar drains, and, and our CSF leak rate has dropped from 8% to 2%. And beautiful facial uh, outcome, and, and, and immediate relief of her uh, uh, trigeminal nerve dysfunction. This is another case, outside hospital, surgical debulking via retrosigmoid, and tumors start growing again. They recommend gamma knife. A patient came to us for second opinion and we recommend the translab approach. Same thing, immediate facial nerve uh, function was grade three and improved grade two over a year. A young person, no point going back, digging again, removing a little bit and doing gamma knife or gamma knife. So please do not do this, this type of surgeries, okay? Just do your best. Goal with the 100% gross total resection. If not, at least near total resection and observe the rest of the tumor. You don't have to gamma knife right away. If you remove in a way, you devascularize the tumor, remnant won't grow. Even if it grows, it's going to be very slow grow and it's going to surpass the patient's lifetime. And another patient, okay, look at this. This is a patient who had the surgery. They left this much tumor in two years and has grown this one. They removed it. They radiated. 
still tumors grew to this size. Perfect for transplant, okay? Previously in Spain, they did this surgery in, in retrosigmoid, gamma knife, and you don't, you don't come back retrosigmoid. Translap gives you a fresh virgin rod, okay? Grade three immediately, grade one long-term. 61 year old, 60 year old, hearing loss, walking difficulty, preoperative MRI, sub, subtotal resection again, and cyber knife. Look at this. I mean, as they call it this hybrid surgery. There is no such a thing. You don't go there with this idea. See this postoperative MRI with the fat suppression. Very nice, good resection. Again, retrosigmoid craniotomy, extreme cerebellar swelling during surgery. They abort the surgery, transfer to patient as patient had hydrocephaly. All we did is they put the ventric first, stabilize the patient, then came back, did the uh, uh, translap approach, and perfect facial outcome. And sometimes there are uh, tumors that they receive the radiation right away. And this is one of them. For example, uh, uh, in 2010, they radiate this patient, radio surgerized. Uh, it continues to grow in two years. And we did the retrosigmoid approach, okay? Grade two facial function. The patient is completely fine. So uh, uh, small tumors, I understand. You can do, you know, gamma knife, radio surgery uh, in elderly patients, young patients, I'm against any kind of radiation. We don't know the side effects of radiation in long term. And if you can, goal should be 100% resection, okay? And so now I'm gonna touch base on this. Uh, as rarely these cases present as an emergencies, okay? Or urgent cases. So I'm gonna show my philosophy on staging these. Uh, I, I get criticized about this, but I don't, that's okay. You can criticize me, but I'm gonna explain you why. Uh, not every case, in some cases, tumor is very large and you keep going very vascular and it becomes 2 a.m., 3 a.m., you get tired. You can stop at that time. This is unexpected, unplanned staging, okay? Then you come back in two days or three days and then do the rest of it or whatever. These are unplanned staging due to the conditions at that current time. There are sometimes other type of cases, patients come with the emergencies. These tumors can cause intratumoral bleeding. Believe or not, it's not rare having the large acoustic neuroma bleeding inside. So this is a 48 year old man presented with sudden left side hemifacial numbness, sensory hearing loss, and is extreme extreme headache and and nausea vomiting. So if you look at these images carefully, there is an intratumoral bleeding. Some of them it looks like cystic tumor, but there is a blood within the tumor and sudden compression causing the severe headache. And this comes and you, you can he cannot wait to set up the OR, change your schedule. Get, getting the neurotology colleague to do the trans lab. So you need, you need to buy a time. In these cases, staging is perfect. How I do it, this is the way I do it. I come with the uh, uh, retrosigmoid. This patient had a, I believe first we put the ventriculostomy and quick retrosigmoid approach. And then the second stage, we waited. Is stable. We removed the removed the uh, probably 60, 70 percent of the tumor, and we stopped just because in the middle of night you want you don't want to go do eight, 10 hour surgery. You have to be smart about this. And then in few days you come back, okay? You do the fresh approach, trans lab. You can come back retrosigmoid too. But and now I have a I think in my mind. Translab is superior approach. So I come back at the translab and remove the rest of it with the translab. These are not common cases, rare, 
uh, in my series, not more than 10 I did like this, but uh, you need to be aware and you need to be smart. That's why I'm showing you. So it's, and then if you wait too long, due to the scarring, whichever approach you do, it becomes more difficult. Uh, so if you are not familiar with the translab, do, do retro sigmoid. Come back and do the second stage retro sigmoid, but do good job. So uh, you so that these you look at these tiny vessels right on the surface of the tumor, and you follow these like meningiomas or any other any other tumors, and then if they are giving branches to the uh, tumor, take take only those branches like AVM side fields right, and then look at these engorged veins. Be careful with those veins. Gently compress them and try to move. If you apply too much suction, you can you can cause bleeding. See, it is a very thick arachnoid, and sometimes these patients' uh, a tumor can be very adherent to the uh, 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 brainstem surface. So try not to be subpeel in the brainstem dissection. Okay, that's that's the key. You can damage the brainstem. So and there's always this two layer of arachnoid here. You pull. You can apply pulling technique, peeling technique, like Sammy introduced, or sharp dissection, spreading, or combination, like every other microsurgery we do, right? If one move doesn't work, go to the other move. And gently, see that tiny vessels going into the, going into the tumor, you can take, the rest you preserve. And now, going back to debulking. That's the original debulking. You see there's a hemor hemorrhagic cavity here. And now it's easy. It becomes easier as you debulk. Uh, and, and don't take me wrong, these surgeries are not easy. Uh, so, uh, and outcome of these surgeries are cosmetic, right? It's just it's aesthetic, patient's facial function. It's not like life and death situation. So it was in the first stage when the patient came, uh, he, he was very sick but we stabilize him with the ventric and the taking him decompressing the brain stem and then come back and do doing the final final stage and the ball go back to the superior pole see and if if this not working go to the sharp dissection whichever one works so just be versatile don't be dogmatic about i always do this technique i, I always do that no, there is no such a thing. Whichever technique works. If you are doing one move three times and if you are not achieving the goal, change your plane. Do something else. Okay? Come back to that point later. Now I'm going to fi find the nerve. And in some cases even, see the, this is the chorate plexus. These are the actually... Uh, believe it or not, there are anastomotic nerve fibers between seven and eight, can be sometimes, and or those fibers can be uh, in nervous intermediates. So I'm amputating the eighth nerve. Patient has no hearing. Okay, remember that. So I can, I can take his eighth nerve, but the patient has a hearing, as it's serviceable, and it's reasonable chance to preserve you have to preserve the hearing, and then you do the retro sigmoid approach. Correct plexus again, and I'm I'm checking for the this is the this is the eighth nerve amputated, is it was blending with the tumor. See, I'm dissecting off that, and and the anterior aspect. Yeah, anatomy never goes wrong. Anterior aspect, I'm gonna find the find the uh, facial nerve. Okay. The traction, contra-traction, traction, contra-traction, contra sharp dissection, spreading, peeling, but is gentle. And how I develop these techniques? I develop these techniques in the lab. When I when I did the middle cerebral artery occlusion in the rats, I, I learned sharp dissection. When I clean the cadaveric heads, P arachnoid, I learned these peeling techniques. Okay. It doesn't come to you right away. Like you have said, you know, you, you have to complete that 100,000, I'm sorry, 10,000 hour rule, okay? And then you combine with the lab, these come, they'll come to you. It doesn't happen, you know, you, 
these techniques you just don't one day you wake up and oh i, I i'm the best uh, micro dissector no there is no such a thing okay so we go so it's very dense and in front of the eight cranial nerve entrosome there is a dense uh, uh, arterial network of aica okay so you need to clean that arterial network and preserve the pia same time okay this is key and always protect your planes with these small cotton balls okay now i i'm getting to the facial nerve okay so it, there will be nervous intermediates and there will be facial nerve okay the, the, these these sharp dissectors are very helpful at creating a plane uh, or micro scissors uh, I don't like uh, uh, peeling technique when it comes to the facial nerve. I like gentle traction and contra-traction, okay? So now whole facial nerve enters on is exposed, okay? So I need to connect this with the porous and the canal. So now I'm going back to canal, finding the facial nerve, okay? And then once we connect it, this is gonna be the facial nerve. And cochlear nerve, you, you, you can take it. In some cases, uh, in the bit retro sigmoid, you can preserve the cochlear nerve and that, that, that you can give patients the cochlear implant. And that's a different story. Uh, so continuous and see, these are the, this is the most critical part of the surgery. All blood supply in the, at this level comes from this extra dual. And then translab, gives you this widest exposure. If you do retro sigmoid, you won't be able to see this wide, okay? And you either you leave remnants, if you look at those people I claim, I can do this retro sigmoid, there's some residual in the canal, okay? Because you cannot see, even if with the endoscope putting, uh, you'll have a hard time. That's, the, that's why I love translap. Number one, I don't deal with the cerebellum. I don't even see the cerebellum. It's completely epidural approach. Like if you are doing a Dolenche approach for cavernous science, you are completely epidural. Okay, now this facial nerve free, and we're gonna go back. I can speed up if we are not doing well with the time. Okay, stimulating and low intensity debulking. Low intensity debulking. And, and sometimes you if you get sudden irritation in the facial nerve stop dissecting okay just let the facial nerve rest put a little bit nipride solution or popovarian solution over the facial nerve you, patient, patient nerve can get small uh vasos, small vasal vasospasm okay so that's the facial nerve see it's coming from the canal is going to so i i need to connect these two planes okay and it's sometimes Yes, it's true. This is if I did this in sitting position, blood goes away. But doing the uh, sitting position in trans lab is uh, uh, my ENT colleagues, neurotologists will be crazy uh, uh, drilling the bone like this uh, three hours. So, uh, and then I tell you the truth: spine is the best. Best. I don't like prone approach. I don't like sitting approach. I'm telling you right away uh, because I get tired in the board. If I can, I would like to do every surgery in spine position. It's very physiologic. I can stand up, I can sit, I can do, I can change my posture, but if sitting and if prone, you are limited. Your neck and back gets, gets hurt. And in the sitting, your shoulder. Uh, if we have to, yes, we have to. So then, see now, facial nerve is free. And this is the cystic portion of the tumor. Cystic tumors are notorious for being ad adherent to the brain stem and the cranial nerves. So you can create the plane and try to don't violate the wall of the cyst, okay? So this is, see that, that this is the external supply. I just, it was coagulated before. So now I take it, take it out. So I'm gonna jump these and then eventually remove it. See that branch is giving a small feeder and otherwise, if you take that, that's the brainstem artery, okay? 
So you don't do that. You follow it and you take only the feeder. And acoustic neuromas get extradural feeders and intradural feeders. They will get intraaxial feeders from the ICA branches, okay? Very small feeders. So you need to identify this. This is acoustic neuroma surgery is you are, you are doing like an AVM surgery, okay? Okay, this is the facial nerves stimulating nicely. If it stimulates 0 0.05 milliampere, 0 0.1 milliampere, even patient wakes up with the weak face, it's gonna get better, okay? The, so this is preoperative. We debulk with the retrosigmoid, come back with this uh, translap, and perfect face, very happy, and long-term, very good results. So I'm going to skip this. And we did the same thing here, same principle. This patient came with the sudden onset uh, 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 urgent problems. We did the retrosigmoid, come back, the, uh, uh, and as you see, patient has a ventric, and grade three improved grade two now in two months. And another thing I want to touch base before I close. Uh, so nervous intermediates is the forgotten nerve, okay? In large acoustics, you may not be able to preserve the nervous intermediates, but in the moderate size and some small acoustics, please, please spend time, see the anatomy and you can preserve. You do beautiful surgery, Okay, patient facial function is fine. And then he, three months later, patient realized they cannot taste well. And these are the important sens sensory functions, right? It's the daily part of the life. So if you cannot taste it, you cannot eat well. You cannot drink good wine. So uh, this is important. If you can, and moderate size tumors and small tumors, you can preserve the nervous intermediates. You can identify. In some large tumors, rarely, yes. Uh, but most of the time, tumors beyond three centimeters or bigger is not possible to see even. So this is a this is a moderate size tumor, not very big, and no hearing. Okay, uh, then we we uh, uh, we went to do translab. Okay, I'm showing this case to see show you. I'm gonna skip all these parts because I already showed you. This is translab drilling, and you can watch these translab drilling videos in our publications or books. Uh, is a speed up. So we go. Now we're gonna go. Okay, small tumor, easy to identify the structures early, the facial nerve, and see that, and then the eighth nerve, and then we go to the canal. We remove the tumor from the canal, and we're gonna connect two planes. I'm showing this to see you know how we can preserve the so this is going to be in nervous intermediate style we just got the glimpse of it okay small tumors you get less bloody field so it's much much cleaner and easier to see field okay I, that's the eighth nerve patient has no hearing so i'm going to cut that eighth nerve and when you are cutting this nerve, be careful. There's always an arterial loop of the aica between eight and the seven, okay? You can easily cut these arteries. There's a rich arterial network there. So this is the facial nerve, and that's the intermediate nerve, okay? Always stimulate to confirm. Very rarely you can have a two facial nerve. We call it bifid facial nerve. And, and it's split it by the tumor or anatomical variation. So you need to preserve both, okay? You see, this is the artery, and this is the, this is the nerve. See, this is the artery right behind the facial nerve in front of the eight entry zone. And you go, same, same technique between canal and the cisternal segment, remove, that's the brain stem. Keep I I I I'm not steady. Always keep changing my planes, and and then then go around the tumor, debulking. Go around the tumor, debulking. So. 
So that's the where we're gonna meet. Oh, oh, sorry, it's my computer. So now we are coming to do this part of the canal super aspect. That that's the facial nerve is preserved. So I'm gonna connect these two, and the nervous intermediate goes along with the facial nerve. Okay, that's it. That's right here, and it's gonna join. And it's very important function is the taste, right? So it's like hearing, like uh, uh, facial function. Taste is important too. So now we we'll preserve facial nerve, and the and then this is the stump of the uh, uh, tumor. So uh, yes, good radiological result, good facial outcome, and then also we preserve the hearing uh, the nervous intermediates. So it's it's good for the patient's uh, uh, postoperative quality of life. So general principles and tricks. Preoperatively, correct selection of the patient, correct selection of the approach, stage approach if, if there is a problem, emergency cases, and patient's hearing and facial nerve status is important in selecting the approach, correct knowledge of pertinent neuroanatomy, and correct surgeon's discretion. Maximum safe resection versus hybrid. I, again, I don't wanna, I, I don't like doing it, the hybrid surgeries. Why should I charge the patient twice, right? Intraoperatively, CSF drainage is important. You can use lumbar drain, drain but uh, early standard drainage from lateral cerebellar medullary system, retrosigmoid or translap is very is main thing. You drain the CSF and it's it's done. Early localization of the facial nerve course. You can do high amplitude stimulation, and I learned this from Taka Fukushima. So you estimate the course of the facial nerve with the early high uh, stimulation. Occasional use of sodium nitroperoxide solution or papaverin solution to prevent the microspasm around the facial nerve. Correct orientation of the tumor limits, preservation of the nervous intermediates. Intraoperatively, copious warm irrigation, not very jet irrigation, small gentle irrigation, sealing the mastoid air cells, Closure of the station tube. These are these will prevent the CSF leak and the harvesting the fat and packing the fat. Uh, so postoperative, it's, you know, these patients can have a persistent hydrocephaly ventricular megaly. You need to follow that can cause CSF leaks. And if you have a delayed facial or other cranial nerve paralysis, early antiviral therapy is helpful. There's an ENT literature on this and close follow up in cases that you didn't do the gross total resection. So I will look at our, uh, our result and in tumors bigger than 2.5 centimeter, at one year we had a house breaking grade one facial uh, uh, function in more than 90%, I think it's 91 or 93% cases. At, at the tumor is smaller than 2.5 centimeter, we have very good results, 98% grade one or grade two results. So again, at the end, go, read, listen, watch, dissect. I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, I do, I understand. The laboratory practice is, is crucial. It should be mandatory for neurosurgeons. And again, uh, you know, it's how many times I, I emphasize this, just follow the, follow the principles set by our pioneers, Yashagil, Drake, uh, Sant, Sammy, uh, uh, Professor Hannes Niemi, Taka Fukushima. These are very important principles. And then you develop your own, your, your own uh, uh, principles. But uh, don't forget the history uh, and, don't, uh, and then check all the current developments and go to the lab, do the lab dissection. That's the main thing. Again, I'm stopping here and I thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, taking one hour of your time. Uh, uh, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, uh, Professor Hannes Niemi, Yuha, I appreciate your efforts uh, uh, with these uh, ground runs, China ground runs, uh, and spreading the neurosurgery. 
micro neurosurgery and thank you thank you very much thank you mustafa wonderful lecture beautiful surgery so i open the discussion I noted that you are not using strings in your cotons. This is the way I did in Helsinki also. I never used strings in my cottons. I, but I here in China, I have to do. Uh, we have to do here too, but uh, uh, the OR nurses uh, tolerate me and they don't write me up for that. Sometimes it's very, you know, if you have a nurse that, he or she doesn't want to do it. There's no way you can you can break those rules. But uh, it's very soft, and I hate those strings most of the time. Some other comments, questions. So, uh, Mustafa. So you mentioned the uh, staged uh, resection of the tumor but uh, uh, I think uh, what's the threshold for you to make this decision yeah uh, so there's uh, there are two different uh, concepts in this right one some people will stage plant stage for tumors like four centimeter five centimeter they, they will say, I'm, I'm going to stage this. Whichever approach you do, uh, you, they do translap. They come back in two weeks. They will do the rest again translap. Uh, uh, I, am, I don't like that idea. I, if, I, if, I like, if I can, I like to finish everything at once. And only condition, uh, sometimes extremely difficult cases, you keep going, keep going, keep going. And you know the conditions change in the operating room. So in the around 8, 8 p.m., B team comes. Around 11 o'clock, 11 p.m., C team comes. Then you are in hands of God. <laughs> and then, you know, you, you are tired. You, you say, oh, I never get tired. We get tired uh, mentally. And that also drains mentally you. And then the you are at the most important part of the surgery. So it's 2 a.m. You have another five hours to go. I suggest you stop before then. This is un unplanned staging. Okay, this is rare. It happened to me. I don't like doing it, but you have to do it. You have to do it for patient safety. Uh, the other one is the most critical one. I, I mean, I will get criticized and I understand. Uh, doing patient comes urgently, right? And like patient comes in the late afternoon. Setting up trans lab with the ENT colleagues, proper condition for acoustics is not, it may not be possible. So then you, you need to rush. You need to decompress the brainstem. The, the one case I showed you, there was an intratumoral hemorrhage. Patient was extremely sick. So then you put the ventricular stomach, you do whatever, it's not helping, take to the patient, do the retrosigmoid. Retrosigmoid will be much quicker. Uh, you know, in half an hour, you are done with the approach and then you are in the tumor and then you decompress. And then you come back as a second stage retrosigmoid or translap. So that's the only thing. Not, these are not common scenarios. It rarely happens, but I'm giving you the options there are these kind of treatment management options too. So young colleagues should consider. So you don't burn yourself. Patient's safety and the good outcome uh, should come first. Okay, thank you. Uh, but uh, uh, according to Professor Hanis Nemis philosophy, you, you prefer to preserve the nature anatomy which means you don't like to uh, drill in the bones. <laughs> Is it correct? Uh, Professor, how is Naimi? 
my experience in acoustic neuronomas is very small because in uh -huh. Helsinki there was a team who was making them, so I was not involved in the team. So I, I don't want to say actually anything about acoustic neuronoma surgery. I have done 50 or 60 cases in my life, so this is a small experience. Okay, but, uh, Mustafa. Oh, Do you of use course, the uh, ret retrosigmoid yeah. approach is by far faster. So it is uh, this yeah. one you could can of course do even in the night and take take the tumor away. But, uh, yeah. So the translap seems to be very tedious and difficult approach. Cool. And I, I had never seen that. Now I saw it in, in your videos, it certainly is beautiful approach, but uh, it takes time and preparations to come inside. Correct, correct. It's like uh, Dr. Zuz, I, I understand the uh, uh, implication of the Dr. Zuz question is, is, is it seems like invasive approach. You drill the labyrinth, you deal, drill. Uh, in, in a way, it's invasive when it comes to drilling the bone, but is le it, it can be less invasive because you're not dealing with the cerebellum at all. Dura, you are all presigmoid. And I, I showed you, you know, it's the, it, it is, it's uh, being epidural in your approach is very helpful in post, post operative headaches, post op how the patient feels. Uh, uh, in, in a way, invasive, in a way, less invasive, in my opinion. Okay, so do you use some uh, endoscope to assist when you uh, trans uh, retrosigmoid approach? Uh, uh, yes and no. I, I mm -hmm. mean, most of the time I don't need to use endoscope. Mm -hmm. I use open surgery. I mean, just open everything and when you drill enough. But at the, some cases, canal is small, is not expanded by the tumor. Uh, and very narrow canal, you don't see the lateral extent. If you drill more, you're going to lose hearing. You, so uh, th then you, you are blind. In those cases, you can put a small endoscope and look if there's a residual tumor. There was a question about how much fat you are placing postoperative. Uh, are you covering only the uh, pony defect or how... Yeah. How big it's, it's, the area? It's almost like my fist size. Uh, and then we almost f less than my fist size. And then, of course, depends on the patient and the mastoidectomy you did. And we do strips, strips like almost my finger, a little bigger than the finger, and then pack them into the system. If you have to create a plug, part of the fat should be in the cistern and part is out in the mastoidectomy defect. If you put loose fat, uh, it doesn't it doesn't help. Uh, so uh, and uh, I learned all these techniques from the ENT colleagues. Uh, they they have been doing this years, many years before us. So uh, it's very helpful. And the spinal drain helps to get the fat closer to the skull base or. Yes. So uh, before five years ago, we look into our results, and our results uh, indicated that we had an eight percent uh, postoperative CSF leak in all all approaches: middle fossa, retrosigmoid, and translap for acoustics. So it is good. Eight percent is okay. If you look at the literature, it varies from five to fifteen percent. Uh, so, but I, I. I you get frustrated. You do beautiful surgery. Patient comes back with the CSF leak from nose, ear, or the wound. You know, it's the extra hospitalization. You put the lumbar drain at that time. So I said, why don't we put the lumbar drain during the surgery and see what's going to happen? And people try this and the results are various. Some, some of them is good. Some of them not good. But we were, we were able to bring it down to the 2%. Significant change. Uh, we keep lumbar drain three, four days, and they require that much hospitalization most of the time anyway. We don't, we don't cause anything, and it's un done under general anesthesia during the surgery, and we, we don't drain too much. If you drain too much, patients will feel sick. So enough, 
And then in day four, we remove it and send patient and still we get, we didn't bring it to the zero percent, but it's at least it's around two percent. And the middle fossa approach, when you are using that? Middle uh, fossa. Middle fossa approach is strictly for intracanalicular tumors. I show you at the beginning of the case and for hearing preservation and is tumor is way lateral in the canal. So with the retro sigmoid, you will have hard time reaching out. Then you have to drill a lot. And the drilling itself, even if you don't destroy the uh, cochlea or uh, vestibule, just drilling can cause conductive hearing loss near the cochlea. So it is, that's why it, retro sigmoid is good for the tumors more medial, intracanalicular. Middle fossa is good for the tumors very lateral in the canal. There was a question, what kind of imaging you use to see the seventh nerve? Or can you see it by present ima imagination, preoperatively? Uh, uh, you know, the, there's the cranial nerve T2, uh, cranial nerve imaging you can use, but uh, in the large tumors, there's no way you can differentiate what is a cranial, uh, which one is which one. In small tumors, you can estimate, but at the end, is your anatomy and surgical exposure. You, you, you know the nerve, uh, so its nerve is going to be anterior superior or anterior inferior. I never seen a uh, acoustic neuroma, facial nerve courses posteriorly or within the tumor. That is not acoustic neuroma. That is a facial nerve schwannoma. And your facial nerve stimulation, uh, stimulator, so you are touching the nerve and yes. stimulating. And uh, how are you controlling? You have a so you have control. Correct. We do everything by ourselves. We don't have a special monitoring uh, team for that. So we put electrodes, uh, uh, two electrodes, and and then it it delivers the uh, lowest possible is the 0 0.05 milliampere. If you are delivering that and you get direct uh, 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 response with the sound, and it gives you beep 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 sound. And then if if nerve is healthy, perfect. If you start going higher from zero zero point five to the one zero point one. 0 0.15, 0 0.2, that means nerve is getting weaker. So you should stop. If you go, if nerve stimulating higher than 0 0.2, 0 0.2 milliampere, nerve, you're going to have a significant facial palsy. It's still good. It may improve. The nerve is not stimulating at all. That's a bad sign. But if you anatomically preserve some, I know it, some surgeons do like, oh, I lost the facial nerve function. I can cut the nerve now. No, don't cut it. It may, it may recover. Are there may, more questions in the chat? Can you check, John? I have a bypass surgery, so I better go in yeah. a few minutes. Yeah. We thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Much for a wonderful lecture and uh, excellent thank uh, you. lecture on good dissection of uh, intracranial beyond for every Mustafa, yeah. yeah. Your surgical video is very good. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm yeah. gonna do bypass <laughs> surgery, but I'm not as good as I'm not as good as you. So <laughs> watch, watch out, watch out. <laughs> so uh, I, I can do only one bypass in a day, unlike you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Bypasses. Amazing surgeries. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thanks, okay. everybody. Thank you, Ha. Thank John. Thank uh, Binzu. All the Chinese friends, all the colleagues. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening, wonderful afternoon, wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thank we'll you. See you thank you. We'll, see, we'll see you next week. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.